Tim. Reading about Greg, it's uh, something that kind of resonates with me because I grew up on a dairy farm, uh, 50s, 60s, uh, and a lot of farms, as you can imagine, were uh, you know, gone by that point. Those of us who loved agriculture, but also saw too what was happening, especially in conventional agriculture, had this kind of moment of where uh, we kind of wanted to stay in agriculture as farmers, but there was always a push back from uh, the kind of work that conventional farming and the people, the way that farms were run at that point. Certainly what drew me to NOFA as an organization was the positive vibe that I got from farmers who were interested in organic agriculture. Uh, many people are driven to organic agriculture for many reasons, but for my uh, personal experience, it was that kind of moment of where um, my dad didn't want me to farm on our farm, which had been a multi-generational farm back into the early 1800s, and in fact from um, Vermont and from uh, uh, you know Scots-Irish heritage, of which land was very important to us, um, and I couldn't quite understand why my dad was driving me away, but at the same time, part of that was the fact that as a conventional farmer, he didn't feel good about what he was doing. And so it resonates with me, Craig, about how you know your relationship to the farm and what you now do is so important because basically what we're all trying to do here is farm in a way, produce food that is of high quality and that we can be proud of. And so it always pleases me to see an organization grow like this. Um, well, I'm also a statistical geek, I'll admit that. Um, and in fact, the Ag Statistics uh, Annual Report for New York State was part of our bathroom reading. Uh, it was one of those things that where if you wanted to learn about you know, corn production in different counties of New York State, then you were there for a short period of time. If you wanted to see the rankings of milk production in the United States, who was number one, who was number two, obviously Wisconsin was one all the time, but to watch California creep ahead in New York drove me crazy. So you didn't come here to learn the bathroom habits of the Coxes, though. So uh, I do have some t statistics that I thought were pretty interesting that are for Massachusetts. And this one blows me away, and I think that this is important and touches upon what Greg's going to speak about. Between 1950 and 2007, between 1950 and 2007, a span of 57 years, in 1950, there were over 5,000 dairy farms in Massachusetts. 5,000 in Massachusetts. In 2007, there was 180. There's a lot of us farm boys out there looking for work. In other words, basically, there's that many farms that have disappeared. In 2002, 10% of the land in Massachusetts was in farms. 207,000 of it was in crop, 31,000 in pasture, and of that pasture land, that part of that was 26,000. But in crop land, that 207, that also includes hay ground. So there's hay and pasture ground over tens of thousands of acres here in Massachusetts. Between 1992 and 1999, an annual loss of 5,400 acres per year in Massachusetts alone. And in between 97 and 03, it slowed down to 2,000 acres per year in Massachusetts, lost to development and other kinds of non-agricultural uses. So basically what my point is here is that there's plenty of pasture land here in Massachusetts. It's maybe of questionable quality, but basically there's still pasture land here. And there is an answer to those of you within this audience looking for the kind of quality agricultural production that really get your juices flowing. So please welcome Greg Judy for me. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to be here with the uh, first time I've been in Wooster. I guess I pronounced that right, a Wooster. You know, I, I looked at that on the internet, and I went, in Missouri, we want to pronounce that Worcester. And my intern said, Greg, don't go there and call it Worcester. So anyway, um, we're going to talk this morning um, I'm from central Missouri. My wife, Jan, and I, we farm there. Uh, we do grazing uh, 100%. Uh, we kind of pride ourselves that we don't have any equipment. We feel like, uh, you know, to make a living from the land, we don't need to be chasing equipment around. And so it's, it's costly, and it's, it's, you just don't need it. 
If you learn to use your animals correctly, uh, they are our full equipment line. And the neat thing about livestock is, you know, when you use them correctly, they're raising one for you, they're putting weight on, and they're improving the land, the soil, the water, and the quality of our food all in one fellow swoop without using fossil fuel. Folks, we have a wonderful animal here. I'm talking specifically about ruminant animals. We've taken a herbivore, which is kind of a tragedy. We've got this beautiful herbivore. We've turned her into a fossil fuel guzzling machine by putting them in feedlots. And it's just crazy that we've done this to our cow. Um, you know, we talk about how healthy beef is. It is. It's very healthy when it's raised correctly, and it's healthy on the environment. You know, you listen to some of Alan Savory's TED Talks, and it's the only animal we have. It's the only animal we have left that can heal and stop global warming. It's pretty exciting stuff, I think. I think we're living in an exciting time. You know, this is nature's image. Animals, the grass, the soil, the watershed, it's all tied together, folks. We are part of this chain. The way we raise our animals is a direct reflectance on us. You take good care of your animals, you ought to feel good about yourself in the morning when you wake up. When you go to bed at night, you should feel like your animals are well taken care of. And if they aren't, well, then you're not doing your job. We are stewards of the land and the animals. We should feel good about this job. It's a wonderful job. We've been handed. Species diversity. You know, we like to see species, different species. You know, when I go across a, if I'm driving on the road and I see a single species of anything, it gives me cold chills. I like diversity. I like to see the wildflowers. Flowers. I like to see different types of animals out on the land. I don't want to see one species of anything. You know, Ian, my cohort in, in uh, Africa, South Africa, Ian Itchel Minnis, Ian Itchel Ian Mitchell Innes, he's a, a large uh, grazer there. They, they run about 14,000 acres, and he's got diversity. He doesn't run just livestock. He's got 18 species of big game now that have come onto his land, wild animals, 18 different species. And the reason they've come onto his land is because of the way he's grazing. And so I think that's something we should all look for. Do you all know that for every species that you can make a home for on your land supports eight additional ones? Think about that. What if we think about our farm as a spider web? In other words, we want as many strands interconnecting out there as possible. And if you remove one of those strands, your farm is weaker. So we need species, we need lots of webs. And while we're speaking about spider webs, of all things, when you walk out in your pastures in the morning in the summertime, you should see thousands of them. If you see thousands of spider webs across your pastures, that's a good thing. Why are they there? It's because your land is healthy. You've got food. These are predators, and they're feeding on the prey that you're raising on your farm. So we like to see lots of species. Predator-prey relationship. What we mean by that is, back before a white man arrived, the buffalo and these large herds of elk and whitetail and everything else, they had to stay in large herds. If they didn't, they got picked off by predators. Well, we don't have that predator anymore, so to speak, to keep our animals mobbed together. And so we use electric fence. Electric fence is our predator. So we can duplicate a lot of what was happening out on the prairie for thousands of years before we came along and boogered it up by building fence and shooting all the buffalo, we can still heal land. And so there's a process we call landscaping with livestock. Where you're using the animals, I like to use the term bruising the soil. We've got to get this soil woke up, folks. We've got to get a litter bank put on the ground. What's a litter bank? It's anything organic as an insulation mat that feeds the soil, microbes. When you walk out into your farm and your pasture, you should look down underneath your grass, there should be a dead layer. 
laying between the grass blades. That's feeding the earthworms. That's feeding the billions of microbes that are living out there on your farm, hopefully. Okay? We've got to get this trampling going. Well, how are you going to get it trampled on the ground? You've got to mob your animals together for a short period, then move them. They were on this hillside of a pond. I put them there for about five minutes. We just walked them back and forth six times. It was real tall, nasty, dry, old grass that needed to be trampled on the ground. Guess what that pond dam looks like now? Beautiful. It's beautiful because now we've got life. They pooped and peed on the side of that hill. Okay? They got some microbes inoculated into the soil. And now the cows, when you turn them into that pasture, that's a person's front yard, by the way. We grace people's yards. We don't let them go up and knock on the door, but they graze yards. We use tree swallows for fly control. We've got 450 tree swallow houses built on our farms now. Tree swallows, an adult pair, uh, they'll eat about 8,000 flies a day. They're swarming over the, top of our fly, over the top of our cows constantly. We don't use any kind of pour on or fly control. It's crap. Folks, anything you pour on your cows or your sheep or whatever to resist all these boogers that we think are going to kill our animals is killing your soil. You can't magically pour something on a cow's back and expect it to go away. It doesn't. It ends up in the microbes. You're killing your manure pads. Anytime you pour anything on your animal, you're killing the manure pads. A manure pad is an advantage to have. Not if you're pouring your animals, it's not. Because now nothing will eat them. They should be something that is very beneficial to the land. So we're using tree swallows. Um, that are just a wonderful addition to our farm. You need to put them out in the pasture. That's where they like. Keep them out in the open pasture. You've got to have grass genetics. Folks, that's grass genetics. That animal, you've got to have the big gut on your animals, and you need little bitty legs, short legs. We don't want animals that look like giraffes walking around out here. I'm sorry, but if you're trying to do grass-fed, sustainable, good, healthy meat, you're not going to do it. Well, you might, but you're going to be selling an inferior product, an animal that can't get fat on grass. You want something that will get fat in 24 months when you're talking about beef. You don't want to winter that thing a third year. So get the thing fat, keep the legs short, stocky built animals. See, you've got to have some place to put all this grass. You know, a cow is eating 3% of their body weight, or a sheep, it doesn't matter, a sheep, goat, whatever. The more compact they are, the less surface area they have, the more efficient they are. So they're going to be more efficient at healing the land. That's what we're talking about, healing the soil. We've got to have some workers. And these workers got to work with what's out there. You can't afford to go buy all this expensive grain and feed these things to keep them going. We need more young people. We've got to get more young people on the land. I'm excited to see all the young people in the crowd today. This is awesome. We just got to get you all out on the land. Folks that have land that need some young people, we need mentors. We need people to teach them how to do some of these processes. Folks, the opportunities are there. They're there. For anybody that wants to learn, they're there. Um, there's people that are retiring age, all the baby boomers. They're getting of age. You know, they're going to have to hand, do something with this land. We talked about it being, you know, taken out of egg. Well, we need people to step in and keep it in a farm. Keep it producing food. Concrete doesn't produce food. And, you know, we talked about the dairy farms here in Massachusetts, we had over 8,000 in Missouri. The last numbers I heard, it's under 500. I mean, our dairy herds, our dairy farmers have been decimated in Missouri. But all those barns out there, they're empty dairy farms. I look at that as an opportunity, you know, for somebody to go in and do it right. We've got to educate the next generation. We can't expect to throw a young person out on a farm and say, go do it. 
You can't do that. They need to be educated, and they need to be educated correctly. Go learn from somebody that's actually doing it. You've got to have passion, folks. You've got to have passion for what you're doing. If you don't have passion, you're not going to be successful. I don't care what you're doing. You've got to have passion. Be willing to learn. Um, You've you got to start at ground zero. Read. You can do that. Read. Do all the reading you can. Get all the publications you can. Try and learn as much about these processes as you can. We call worm castings. This is something that's really turned our farms around. See, we, we've got 15 farms today. I started out in 1999. I was almost broke. And we started leasing land. That's what we did. And we started running other people's cattle on other people's land. That's how we got out of debt. And so we built our money up over a period of time, was able to buy all of our own cattle today and pay off our debt. And so today, we don't work for other people, we work for ourselves. I'm, I am a full-time farmer now. I quit my off-farm job. But to get there, this is what brought us along. When I started focusing on feeding the soil, the litter bank I was talking about earlier, that's what this dead stuff is. Okay? You've got to have the dead stuff on the ground. Don't think about it as waste. Everybody thinks that when you bring livestock onto a pasture and they trample it on the ground, oh, they didn't eat it. It's waste. That's not waste. That's gold. It is. Think about this. For every grass blade that a cow can trample on the ground, you get two back. Or a sheep. Doesn't matter. Think about that. If you put a dollar in the bank today, do you get a dollar back? I don't see anybody shaking their head yes. So, yeah, the earthworms are the powerhouses of our farms. I don't care if you're here in Mass or in Missouri or California. We need earthworms. This is our winter's hay supply. This is nature's winter hay. We don't own a tractor. We don't put up any hay. Um, we do buy a little hay for the ice storms that we occasionally get. But, you know, the animals are healthy. They're happy. Did you know cows, sheep? They like to graze. They don't like to stand around a bell ring. Even with snow on, they'll still go out there and graze, push their head through the snow and graze. But the key is you've got to learn to manage your pastures differently. And we talk about that in our day seminar today, but you've got to learn to, to manage your pastures differently to get winter feed. But this is a lot better than going out and putting hay up on your farm or buying hay to bring in. They can do it themselves, and they do fine. This is the next generation, kids. How many of you all have brought a group of young kids onto your farm on a Saturday morning, take them out and show them the animals, dig up some earthworms, and feed them a nice hot lunch off your farm? We all need to do this, folks. We all need to do this. You know, I can remember things that happened to me special when I was five, six, seven years old. You remember that for your whole life. Everybody in here, we're talking about trying to spread the word and get more, you know, this, this GMO thing. I, I just hate it, that they, you know, what they've done to us on that. But we can get the word out. There's more of us than there is of them. There really is. We can change. We can switch this thing around. But it all starts with the consumer. These are all future consumers. It's the consumer that's going to change it. Somebody asked Alan Savory at the Voices Conference this last year in San Diego. He said, you know, this, and I'm not picking on vegetarians, but this guy was a vegetarian. <laughs> and he said, what are we going to do with all these livestock you say we need to change the planet temperature? And Savory says, get on with it. We don't have time to argue. Just get on with it. That's what he's saying. We need to get on with it. You know, we're all on the same team. We, 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 we all want the same thing. We want a better life, better health for our children, for the future. We need to stop killing this planet. Do you know we're killing this planet pretty quickly? All the stuff we're putting on it, I mean, it's pretty bad. But we can change it, and that's, that's what's exciting. That's hard to read, but that one manure pile has 462 earthworms in it. Did y'all get that number? 
462 earthworms, one manure pile, the intern and I counted them. <laughs> he actually came up with 463, I came up with 462. <laughs> An earthworm lives seven years and they produce 1.2 million worms in their lifetime. Are you all excited yet? The lowly little worm. Yeah. It's, it gives me cold chills. Um, if you get up to 25 worms per acre, 25 worms per acre, you're looking at 100 tons of earthworm castings per acre per year. 25 worms per square foot, I'm sorry. 25 worms per square foot. I'm like, whoa, those are pretty energetic worms. No, 25 worms per square foot. And you don't have to dig up a square foot. I did that. It's a lot of work. Just take a pair of scissors, grab it in your pasture, and measure off one square foot, and clip the grass off, and count the holes going down. That'll give you a real good average of how many worms. It is the best indicator of soil life, soil health. How many worms are working out there for you? Let's, let's start looking at some of this stuff, folks. Winter time. Oh, we gotta feed hay. No, you don't. The cattle are fat eating it through the snow. But there's something there for them to eat. And that's the whole key. This is a riparian zone. Everybody says that cattle and livestock destroy creeks and rivers. I will agree, they do. If you leave them there 100% of the time. If you don't, and you learn how to graze with them, this particular practice, they're only on that creek for half a day and we strip graze them across the creek. Guess what happened? It started flowing again. There's streams. It's got fish in it now. I use that as a water source. It was a dry creek bed. Why is that happening? And that's because all the watershed above this creek now has a litter bank on it. It has a litter bank. It's catching the water. And it's slowly releasing it to the aquifer. Now my creeks are full. Done. Cattle. No earth mover, no dozer, livestock. It's another picture. If you step off in that, you're going to go to your waist. It's deep. There's fish in there. There's frogs. Yeah, it's natural. Look at the, you know, folks, we'd be in a world of hurt if we didn't have grass. Did you all know that? Think about that. If the world didn't have any grass, it wouldn't be safe to walk outside because all you'd be breathing is dust. Grass holds the whole world together. That's a terrible picture on that screen, but that's a turkey. We're getting lots of wild turkey. We have hunters. We have hunters. They like seeing wildlife. Grain or grass? You can tell which one was grass. The yellow one. We need fat on our animals, healthy fat. And we don't seed anymore. Nature seeding is always best. Nature does it best every time. There's never been a seeding done that's paid for itself as well as nature can do it. There's been seeds dropped for thousands of years. The problem is we don't know how to manipulate the seed bank with the cows or the sheep's hooves or goats or whatever. We've got to learn to use nature. We don't need to be putting thousands of dollars a year out here in seed. It's just a waste of time and money and precious resources. We like to see flowers, wildflowers out in the pastures. It's kind of nice to look out and see. Quality water, talked about earlier. Folks, I have a belief in all livestock. I don't care what it is. You shouldn't make animals drink water that you won't drink. Now, I grew up on a farm, a dairy farm, up in northern, northern Minnesota. And we moved to Missouri in 1967. And I was taught from the old timers, oh, if it's a little brackish, it's fine for a cow. No, it's not. <laughs> it shouldn't be brackish. It should be clean water. If it's clean water, guess what? Your cows don't get sick. 
You know, we don't vaccinate anything, never have. We don't worm anything. Our cows never see a head catch. They don't get sick. Why do cows not get sick? It's because we're moving them. We're only taking the top third of the plants every day. The top third. All your parasites and nasties hang out down in the bottom part. So we're just taking the cream, the tip of the plant. That's why our animals don't get sick. Just giving them ice cream every day. It's a pretty good life. But see how clean that water is? That's what you want. You want clean water. This farm on the left is no management. This one on the right is fully recovered. That was grazed in the early spring, and now we're into September. It's got a full rest period behind it. Now, most people who look at that one on the right, you can hardly see the guy standing in there. You're like, Greg, that looks like it's pretty well gone. I wouldn't want to put animals in there. I'm like, yeah, but get down and start digging. There's earthworms all over that. That's because we made a home in there, and we're going to feed them. So we're going to bring the cattle in, trample all that stuff on the ground. They're going to eat a little bit of it. We're going to give a smorgasbord to our microbes. You talk about healthy soil, we've got to feed it. But you need to feed what grows out there on your land. You can bring in stuff, but it's not near as adapted to what's growing on your land. Okay? That's just a pretty picture. Um, we, got sheep, we got into the sheep business because we have 15 farms. We don't own a tractor. We don't own a, own a brush hog. And I wanted to control the weeds. And that's what the sheep do for us. They control the weeds, the brambles. I call a uh, hair sheep is like a, a goat on steroids, except for they stay in. Okay? If you can throw water through a fence, it won't hold the goat. Um, these, these sheep have done very well for us. They're just a really easy-keeping animal. And we, the hair sheep are a welcome addition to our farm. <clears throat> We're getting into permaculture. We just started. We built our first swales. They're filled up with water already. Um, we're going to be planting trees on the downward spiral of all these berms on the bottom. Whoops. Yeah, on the downward slope. Um, we're, we're wanting to grow more food. I look at all these pastures, and I'm like, okay, we're raising grass. We've got livestock. i like to have more food out there, more mass-producing type stuff. So we're looking at, you know, planting pecans, chestnuts, persimmons, mulberry. Uh, we're even looking at honey locusts. Can you all believe that? Honey locust, the thorny one. We just leased a new farm, 240 acres, and it's full of honey locust trees. And I'm going in there and making a honey locust savanna. I'm cutting out, and like there's seven trees come up in a clump, I take them all out but the nice one. I leave one. Do you all know honey locust puts out, if you put a honey locust tree every 50 feet, on a per acre basis, it's equal to 55 bushel of corn per acre. Honey locusts, these thorny things. In production of food, that big old bean that comes off of there is 33% fructose, sugar. It's great animal feed, and it grows naturally. You only plant it once in your life. Most of the time, nature will plant it for us. So what are we doing? Maybe we need to look at some of these trees that we're fighting on our farm. Can we make some money with them? Absolutely. What about the invasive species that are take, coming in? Autumn olive. Coppice it. Chop it off. Let it grow back and let our animals eat the leaves instead of killing it. There's a lot of, a lot of that stuff that I think we can do. That's why we're so excited about planting. We're going to plant apple trees, pear trees, peaches, cherry, grapevines. Uh, for those of y'all who ever heard of Mark Shepard, you need to check him out. Uh, Restoration Agriculture, he's got a book out. Mark's uh, pretty sharp. We did a workshop with Mark this fall. That's another one of the swales. What we're trying to do is hold the water up on the side of the hills and grow some food with it, whether it's grass, trees, whatever. And rather than that ending up down in the Missouri River, we're keeping it on our farm. You should try and keep every drop of rain that falls on your farm, on your farm. Now, if your neighbor wants to lose his, capture it.
There's the young folks we're talking about. We need to educate them where they're getting their food. Animals that are in their own environment. And there we are walking to work. Uh, we don't own, we don't make these cows travel in a trailer anywhere. We walk them. So on cattle day, we just make sure everybody's at work at 10 in the morning and we take all walking. Our animals really, it's kind of neat. You've got your, your mother, daughter. Here's this year's calf. There's your mother. Then you got the old bulls. They're come, you know, the younger bulls. They'll be within in a bull group. Then you've got your steer group. I mean, it's it's family oriented. It's kind of neat. Um, we've actually got one mob of cows now, 365 days of the year. We don't ever separate. And we've been doing this now for four or five years, and it's pretty exciting stuff. I think we all need to be part of the change. There's changes that need to take place out here, folks. And I've just covered a little bit of the stuff that we're doing, but I'm excited. I'm excited about our future, uh, this movement of where our food's coming from. People are starting to wake up. I mean, I was over in, we were up in Canada at Niagara Falls, and on the public television, they were talking about grass-fed animals. Grass-fed animals. I'm like, what? There was a big company, you know, they were talking about grass-finished animals. You wouldn't have saw that five years ago. So with that, I think my time is up, and thank you all. Greg Giudi, ladies and gentlemen, um, 15 minutes of question and answer, so if the first person has a question, just raise your hand, and then if we'll take some a line of people down here if you have further questions. Anyone have a question for Mr. Judy? Yeah, the, the question was, what's our main market? We're doing both. Uh, we're direct mar we direct market everything in the form of either meat or live animals. Uh, what we're finding out is there's a lot of young entrepreneurs that are starting grass-fed operations, and their meat sales are exceeding the supply. And so that's where we come in. We're selling gooseneck trailer loads of steers uh, that are finished. And I like that market um, because you can get rid of, you know, 8 or 10, 12 animals. Uh, we're selling them wholesale. Uh, my wife, Jan, uh, she sells, you know, bees by the quarter, half and whole. Um, but we're not selling hardly anything to the sale barn. The only thing a sale barn would get would be a call, a call animal. The more you can, you know, you need to be a price setter, not a price taker. Develop your own market, whether it's breeding stock or supplying somebody else with meat, milk or eggs. You be the price setter. You demand what you need to take for that animal. Don't let somebody else set the price. Okay. I just want... I just want to thank you for what you're doing, especially where you're doing it in Missouri. Um, there are some other folks out in Missouri who have a slightly different gospel, as you know. And I'm just kind of wondering <laughs> how you're spreading. It, to me, it's like a message of love and common sense and sustainability. Um, and how's that infiltrating throughout the land uh, in Missouri? And, and are, are you getting a lot of folks coming over to your way, and how can we help you spread it even more out there so that we can make well, some big shifts on it, policy? It's starting to spread. I mean, we're starting to, you know, years ago, you wouldn't have heard anything about it. Um, we are starting to make more of a presence. Um, we've been in some of the TV shows have had us on now, newspapers, um, you know, YouTube. If you go on YouTube, we're, we're out there quite a bit on that. Um, you know, I'm in Canada. We've been to New Zealand, Africa. Um, so we're, we're out there. I think it's growing, and it's growing at a faster clip than it was 10 years ago, I can tell you that. No, it's growing nationwide. It seems like, you know, in California and on the East Coast, you are way ahead of us in healthy food. You are. I think you are. I mean, I see it in North Carolina especially. That's a foodie area out there. It's unbelievable what they get for their burger. You know, if we get much over 5 or $6 a pound for a ground burger, we're going to price ourselves out of a market. In California, they're getting $12. You know, so it depends where you live. But, yeah, the, the word's getting out, and I, I feel good about that. 
And yeah, anybody that you meet, if you're on a plane, you sit down the next to somebody and he doesn't go to sleep, tell him you're a farmer. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And he's going to say, what kind of farmer? And you're going to go, all right, that's all I needed. <laughs> I'm a grass farmer, and here's the story. And tell him your story. And when he gets home, he might tell his wife, or if it was the wife, he, she may tell her husband. If it's a wife, hopefully she'll start shopping for some of your meat and give her a card. Tell her about eatwild.com. That gets you in touch with all the people that are doing some of this stuff. Not all of them, but a large percentage. So that's a great question. Yes? A little bit of background. There's a group of us here. We live in Nantucket. Land is very hard to come by, period. Very expensive. Um, it's very sandy. Can you give us any advice on trying to get pastures, uh, even if we're just trying to grow a very small amount of either pigs or goats or sheep? Or we can't even do cattle. We're right. that small. Right. So we have to really think about dwarf type situations. Yep. I've got Nigerian dwarfs, pigs, mm -hmm. um, sheep, Shetland sheep, and we can well, do chickens. What I, I tell you what we did, and it's not the same as here because it's a different area, of course. You've got to find the land, so you've got to go around. You need to drive around and find idle pieces of ground. There's nothing on it. Maybe it's going to be sometime brought into development, but that may be seven or eight, ten years off. If you can use that land for a while, I have a guy in Houston, he's staying ahead of Houston development. He's buying large tracts of land and putting a ranch on it. I'm talking, he doesn't buy anything unless it's 500 acres. And he's ranching it until Houston catches up with, until Houston catches up with him and then he sells it. Okay. One advantage we have is we have conservation land. Half yep. the island has gone into conservation, but we can't seem to convince conservation that they're letting it go. They come in, they brush mow the scrub so it. we don't have fires. Yep. I'd like to use my goats as a brush cutting team to come in and have fire breaks. Any advice where we can go? You're more, to, to, to you're more apt to be listened to if you stay together as a group, if you can find a group of you. Our, our power is in staying together. Lar okay. Larger, yeah, there you go, those groups. They'll listen. They'll listen more to a group than they will a single person. It's nice to have a farm to go show them. That's what I had. I had a farm set up that was doing this. And I brought the prospective landowner. Well, I didn't. I shot a video. I just got a handheld video and walked out and showed people what I was doing on my land. Okay? Once I did that, I sent that video to my prospective landowner, showed them, and let them sit on it for a while. And... Matter of fact, that lease we just got, that 240 acres, he passed that around to his granddaughter, his son, I mean, the whole family. And now they're on board, you know. So you got, it's education. Maybe give them a book that so talks about. diligence. Yeah, you've got to be, you've got to sell yourself. You've got to be a good seller of yourself. I think we can maybe handle that. How, how do you manage sandy soil? Sandy soil is tough because it grinds it. up organic matter. You've got to bring in supplement, which means if you've got sandy soil, there's nothing there, you're going to have to bring in some form of cellulose, whether it's hay or you know, some kind of carbon. You've got to get carbon on that land and preferably run it through a ruminant animal. Right, I've got goats, so yep. I'm on the right track. Yep, that's Thank right. Thank you. Can you tell us about any um, USDA or NRCS grants, if you've applied for them and gotten them? There is, um, the NRCS does have a, a cost share measure out there for prescribed grazing. And it's a 75-25 cost share. If you got a piece of idle land, let's just say you went and found a, a piece of ground that had some open pasture, mostly cedars, and thorn trees on it. And you went in there and could clear enough that to where it looked like pasture. You could go in and apply for a cost share on that where they would help you fence and water that. 75%. Now you gotta leave it in that program for 10 years, but they'll pay for the water tank, the water line, or maybe even help you build a pond if that's 
something that you want to do. But they, they help on the water and the fencing. Now, they will not pay for the perimeter. They don't pay on the perimeter fence. But there is, there is some cost share money there for that through the NRCS. It's, it's called the EQIP loan. Yeah, and, EQIP. Uh, basically, yeah. you have to have that land in a conservation plan, though. So that's the first step is getting the owner to get that into a conservation plan. Yes. Make sure everybody hears that. Are you getting paid to plant your agroforestry systems? No. You're, I'm doing you're, it on my own dollar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we're extremely fortunate in Missouri, and well, you all, you all have access to our trees too. This nationwide, you can come in, you can order them out of Missouri from Mass. I'm not sure how well they adapt here, but you can do it. I had a lady tell me that in North Carolina, I was at the uh, conference there. But anyway, uh, you can buy trees for 30 cents, you know, bundles of 25. So we're, I ordered 1,400 trees out of the conservation department in the form of persimmon, mulberry, um, all kinds of different bushes that have fruit on them, these wildlife type shrubs. Um, black cherry, you name it, I've got it all coming. I'm probably 12 to 15 different varieties of trees. And I calculated up my cost when I paid the shipping, I've got 30 cents in them per tree. So, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do that for the landowner. It's not gonna be that much. It cost me $400 for all of them, for, you know, over 1,200 and some trees. Pasture so. management can be fun too. We used to put our heifers into the apples and uh, Nothing more fun than watching heifers after they've been drunk on apples. So. <laughs> Other questions, please. Anybody else? Since you're mostly direct marketing, do you find that you have any issues with finding slaughterhouse spaces or, or processing capacity, considering that you've grown so rapidly? Yeah, the question was on slaughter facilities, uh, how far we have to travel and, and getting into them. Uh, yes, that is a, a, a chain link that is backing up. In other words, we need more small processors. Uh, we are extremely fortunate. Uh, we have a processor within five miles of our house. And they've just doubled in size. And so he's doing well. We give him all of our business, even though he's not USDA inspected. So we have to sell him, our customers, live animals. They bring him in. We don't touch the meat. Ideally, it'd be nice to be USDA, but then they've got to put a USDA inspector in that plant. He's not up to that size yet that he can do that. There are USDA process plants around us, but we have to travel several hours to get to them. So right now, we are not going after that market. We're just going after what's local. Folks, I like to keep my money in the local community, period. And if I can help this young guy, he just built on, he actually tripled the size of his processing. We want to give him our business. That's what we're trying to do. Good question. How much is land in Missouri at farms or prices of farms? The, the question was how much is land in Missouri for pasture and crop? Yeah. Uh, crop land in Missouri, you're going to give uh, probably eight to 12,000 an acre for it for good crop land. Uh, pasture land, you're going to give, oh, if it's good pasture, you're going to give three to 5,000, probably an acre. Depending on where it's located, if it's very rural and there's not a lot of cities around it, you might get it for 20, 27, 2800. But it's got to be a big piece. You know, if you're looking at 160 acres in central Missouri, you can count on it bringing somewhere between four and five thousand acres. Four and five thousand an acre. That's for good pasture. But folks, I'm glad he asked this question. I don't look for good pasture. I don't. I look for pasture nobody wants. Maybe it's all brush. This last farm we got, 240 acres, it hasn't had animals on it for 50 years. It's all brush. Guess what it looks like now? We've only had it for three months. We've turned it around. We've got the perimeter fence in. We've got the cedars. We're starting to take those out. I'm keeping the 
thorn trees where I need them for shade and food. It's unbelievable what's happened in 90 days. You can really turn a place around. And I got it cheap. Okay? We're talking, you know, 8 to $10 an acre a year. You can make money grazing any animals at that kind of price. Okay? The more that's there, infrastructure being pens, a barn, good fence, good pasture, you're going to have to pay more per acre to get that because there's more people wanting it. Okay? So look for those pieces of ground that look like they could use a nice little fix-up. Those are the ones you can deal with. That's what we've done. That's what we've done, and we're still continuing to do that. So, yep. So, thank you, Greg. Um, we're going to need to go graze. So, obviously, uh, uh, we need to get going. Greg, of course, we're going to save his voice for the thank afternoon. You so, thank you very much. <laughs>